of course, this is our regional beauty, this is our political romanticism, and we certainly, I, I'm just as much, a, I love it, but we should not instrumentalize it against our opponent, our European opponent. If you do that, ask yourself a question if you're a little bit of a psychologist. Who benefits from it? Who is born? Who benefits from our fratricidal wars and our quarrels? Who benefits from the wars between and among Europeans? I don't want to mention the names, but some of you may take a while guess. I'm sure you will know what I mean by that. <laughs> I could pick up a little bit Swedish, I'm fluent in German, but please do pardon me again. He was talking, he mentioned Islam and Muslim on several occasions. Of course. I mean, in, in Europe, especially in the Balkans, you know, there is even... The word church has a very different uh, connotation than here. It is an ugly, it is a pejorative word, it's a, it's a normative word, but at the same time it's a pejorative. We made the verbs of it. To be Turkicized means that somebody is a very bad guy, so lots of bad issues about the Turks and Muslims especially in Eastern Europe, where there is a great, great deal of resentment against Islam, historically speaking. But then again, ask yourself a question, even here in Sweden, or for that matter, in France, there are five, seven million Muslims, some of them have been assimilated, uh, some of them not, they have The problems are not the Muslims, the problems are us. Let me tell you why. They have the sense of identity, but we don't. So again, I repeat, we have to work on our identity, European white identity. That's what we have to work on. They're aware of that identity. Most of the Muslims you meet, be they from Algeria or Morocco, for that matter, be they, uh, be they from Somalia or from Ethiopia, when they come to the United, uh, to, to the United States or for the matter of France. But it's problem with us, not with them. So we have to refurbish, we have to uphold our identity, which I mentioned earlier. And I hope we can work on that. Let me now move a little bit further, because as I said, I certainly would like to give a lecture over the whole semester about this topic. Let's talk a little bit about the problem, which all, of course has to do a great deal of identity with identity. This is victimology. I don't know if you're familiar with this word victimhood and victimology. It's a relatively new word in, uh, in the English language, which I like very much. Many, many, many uh, peoples, residents living in France, Sweden, Germany, have this sense of victimology and victimhood, which paradoxically has been imposed by them, not by themselves, but by their white politicians. Day after day, I'm sure you, you will get you will get me right away. You hear about the uh, plights of different peoples, uh, the plaque of commemoration now uh, being raised uh, uh, for the Armenians in in, uh, in France. Recently, even the law was passed in the in, 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 uh, in France, where it is even illegal to to, to uh, just to give an example uh, to question the, the number of uh, of victims of casualty during the genocide uh, in, uh, against the Armenians. And, uh, but the problem with each victimology is that by its own definition, victimology tends not to smooth the people into understanding each other, into, into reconciliation, if I can put it better. It actually enhances the possibility of war. I don't want to be too explicit, but I'm sure you know what I mean by victimology. When a nation starts talking about its body counts, how much it suffered during history, how it lost thousands of its citizens, how it lost six millions of its citizens, naturally it enhances more and more and more resentment. It actually creates the, the, the climate for a possible another conflict. Again, let me tell you in all due honesty, the war in the Balkans started simply because the Serbs, they had their mythology and they had their victimology, this was their false identity, because they literally said, well now with the Croatian government, we have the Ustaches back, with the fascists back in power, so they will kill us. They lived in this surreal world of false victimology, whereby their body counts, you understand what body counts means, where their victimology was inflated to really extraordinary numbers. The Croats had the same thing, they actually had this anti-communist type of a victimology that said, well, we cannot live in Yugoslavia because we had such terrible losses after 45, 46, because of course, you know, Croatia was a member, was uh, an ally of uh, the Reich. 
So those three victimologies, those three different identities clash. And what happened was the terrible war. I don't know if you follow me on that, again, for obvious reasons, legal reasons, I don't want to speculate about that. But each victimology, wherever it comes from, be it from the Armenians, be it from the Jews, be it from the Congolese, be it from the Vietnamese, it's a, it just spirals out of, the, of, the, of, of, any, of any rule, of any, of any order. Look, for instance, I'm talking a bit fast, look what's going on now in Sweden, look what's going on now in the United States of America because of the dramatic change in the racial profile of the United States of America. Like, for instance, of course, the public commemoration of the Holocaust, we have Holocaust memorials on many, many, many places in the United States of America. But now, the voice is being heard by Laotians, by the Vietnamese Americans, by the Chinese Americans. Why don't we have our block of commemorations? Why don't we talk about our victimology? Why don't we talk about our identity? Do you see what I'm getting at? In a multicultural society, my first point actually, my, I should have said at the beginning, multicultural society is by definition fragile, extremely fragile. And this is not a value judgment, because I saw it back in Yugoslavia, I saw it in the United States of America as well. Because in a multicultural, or rather multiracial society, you have competing identities of different races, of different myths, of different people, which is inevitably bound to, to, to how can I say, uh, to enter into conflict with a competing victimology. Can you follow me on that? Like, for instance, if you have three different, okay, let me put it graphically. You have in some uh, arrondissement in, in Paris, you have, uh, like in the 12th hour this month, you have lots of French in, uh, from uh, Laos, uh, from uh, Vietnam, uh, all refugees for now, fully French as well. And then uh, in the other one, you have the Muslims. And they don't talk to each other. I mean, they're, they're, there is a sense of this, uh, how to be the first on the hit parade, how to actually project his or, or her victimology on the top of the list. Everybody wants to be first on the list. For the time being, we have the Jewish Holocaust that's first on the list, but I'm not ruling out that we'll have another victimology in the years to come. So basically, my conclusion, I would like to say that multicultural societies, whatever we may think about it, are increasingly fragile society that are bound, that are bound to, I don't want to use a harsh word, explode, but certainly create many, many, many problems. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I guess I should be probably approaching my conclusion because my understanding is we are running out of time and I was also slated for another speech on the origins of the political correctness and the linguistic aspects of it, so if we probably have some time later on, I'll be pleased to give a 15-minute speech afterwards. I will just conclude in five minutes and afterwards you can have a beer or Coca-Cola and we can chat a little bit in private, you can look at some of my books. But basically what I'm suggesting to all of you and to myself as well, First, I mentioned at the beginning, let's avoid the sectarization, or that's not a good word, the ghettoization of our quote-unquote movement. Let's be proud of our parents and our grandparents, whatever their customs may be. Let's get our uh, lifestyles. Of course, look, I, I've got to be dressed up and fine, but I, I can tell you, I grew up with Grateful Dead, with the uh, Uncles, with Lancet as well, so I'm just as much familiar with that music, but play the game in the society. Get yourself a degree. And, and, and be proud of who you are. There's nothing wrong with being Swedish, there's nothing wrong with Swedenborg, with uh, Ibsen, there's nothing wrong with your culture, and we've got to combine that thing in our, in our effort to, to promote ourselves, not just like, like our enemies would like to portray us, like some right-wingers, cannibals, you know, maligners, this is the typical stuff they do. I know the left well because I lived with them for a long time, so I know where they're coming from. And this is the first thing. And the second thing I definitely would like to say at the very last, regardless of all white, European, uh, Swedish, Croatian, French, uh, Spanish identity, always keep in mind our identity, our European identity, should not be upheld at the expense of other identities, be they Arabs, be they Jews, be they Somalis, whoever they are. We should just let them know that they are different and that we are different. So, vive la différence, and thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen.